Well, turn with me to Romans 12. We are continuing our exposition of the book of Romans, and we have finished 1 through 11, and we're about to finish chapter 12, this pivotal chapter in the whole book of Romans. And last week, we were talking about the application of the gospel, and last week we looked at the gospel being applied in the church, that the first place it has to be applied is in the church, and it has to begin there because whatever we're going to do in the culture must flow out from who we are. So we know that that's God's order. We also know that that's God's order of judgment. In 1 Peter 4, verse 17, it says this. It says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Obedience to the gospel is what will be judged in that day. So therefore, we need to be practicing and to applying the obedience to the gospel primarily within the church because the watching world is going to know us In one primary way, right? John 13, 34, and 35, they will know you're my disciples if you love each other. They're going to know we're followers of him by our love for him. And if we're a family, what the scriptures would call us, a household of faith, if we are a family and our family exhibits the same strife, dysfunction, and discontentment and disconnection as every other dysfunctional family in the world, why would those outside want to come inside? So it must begin with us. The gospel application must begin inside the church. But the gospel does not merely regulate our interactions with each other in this body or in any Christian body, but also gives us directives for how we interact outside the church. How are we to interact with, fellowship with, come into conflict with the lost and dying world? How do we do that? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning because when we were radically overhauled, by the gospel, how we interact with the lost was also radically overhauled, radically made new. Because if I was a new creature at my conversion, meaning I once was old, but now I'm new, the old is gone, the new has come, and I was dead in, Christ, dead in sin and now made alive in Christ, then how can it be that when I am sinned against by those who are unbelievers, I am still divisive and angry and vindictive and cutthroat? How can that be that way? It shouldn't be that way. We're going to be told how it must be. Because if Romans 1 through 11 is true for you, meaning that you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ through faith in him, you've been given his righteousness, you know what you were before that happened. You know what you were in that state beforehand. If you've gone through Romans 1 through 11 at all, you know what you used to be. And if you don't know anything, you don't know much Bible, you don't know much theology, you can at least say what the blind man in John 9 said, all I know is I once was blind, but now I see. That, that, that's all he knows, but that is true. So if that's true for you, then why are you expecting those who are blind and lost to behave as if they can see and know the way? They can't. They, that's what the gospel teaches us and instructs us into understanding. If we try to interact with the unconverted, the unconverted world that's being led by Satan, and we leave the gospel behind, then we are the fools. Because the gospel tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who seeks for God. There is none who does good, no, not one. That's Romans 3, 10 through 12. We know that. So if you sin in response to being sinned against by unbelievers who cannot do good and cannot be righteous, who is the fool? You are. Because you know. You are on the other side of Romans 1 through 11. If you grill a T-bone steak, bring it inside the house, and you put it on the kitchen table in the same room as your 150-pound Labrador retriever, and then you get up from the table to go get some spices to sprinkle on it, and you come back, and it's been chopped down in two bites, and you get mad at the dog, who is the fool? You are. Because a dog is a dog. A dog is going to eat that steak when you leave it left alone. That's what they do. And you know that because you're a human being. So you fly off in a rage. Who is the one being irrational? You are. Because you're the one who can think clearly. That's thus with the lost world. God has intentionally left his people on the planet. It's not an accident. We don't get converted and then taken to heaven. We get converted and left here. So how are we to be here? Jesus knew that was a big task, and he prayed for us toward that end. In John 17, the night before he was crucified, he says in verse 14 and following, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but, I ask, but that you keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Jesus prayed for us to have strength because he knew that this interaction with the world was going to be significant. That we need instruction on how to live in the world, but yet remain distinct from it. We need to be taught that. These five verses that we're going to look at in Romans 12, we're going to look at 17 through 21. These five verses, they're all assuming that you will be sinned against by the unbelieving world. Evil will be done against you. That's the assumption. So since it's a guarantee that evil will be enacted against you as a believer from the unbelieving world, how do we respond? How do we apply the gospel in that moment? What does it look like to apply the gospel? What does that mean? Well, it means three things in this passage. It means first, in 17 through 18, that we strive for peace. It means secondly, in verses 19 and 20, that we don't seek revenge on our own. And lastly, in verse 21, it means we let good triumph. That's what the gospel means when we apply it as, our, as we interact with an unbelieving world that sins against us. So let's read our passage before we look at it. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The first way in which we apply the gospel outside the walls of the church comes in verse 17 and 18. We strive for peace. The overarching goal as Christians in the world is peace. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be sons of God. That's what we're supposed to be. We strive for peace. We're not insurgents seeking to establish our religion's dominance by force. It's not what we do. We're peace. Unbelievers are not our enemies. They are our object. They are not the problem. They're the mission. Satan is the problem, not anybody else. Our, we don't fight against human beings. Ephesians 6.12 tells us that. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not fighting people. Who are we fighting? We're fighting against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's our enemy is Satan, not people. They're the object, not the problem. But what about when the world doesn't want peace with us? That happens, right? When they don't want peace with us, what are we supposed to do? Well, when Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, in Matthew 5, verse 9, he wasn't done talking on that topic. In Matthew 5, 10 through 12, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The gospel applied means we labor for peace. Beginning in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Last week what we looked at, we looked at our, our, our retaliation outside the church is never justified, it's never permitted by God. And now we're going to see here that our retaliation or our, last week we saw inside the church. Last This week we're going to see that outside the church, our retaliation is never going to be justified. It's never going to be condoned by God. We're never always sinful to repay evil for evil. One commentator, William Henderson, said, the manifestation of vindictiveness destroys Christian distinctiveness. That when we manifest vindictiveness, it destroys our distinctiveness because we're just like everybody else. We're not distinct in any way when we take our own vengeance. It's distinctly Christian to suffer wrong from the world. And the Bible tells us that that would be so. It's a promise. 1 Corinthians 4, 12-13. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and still are like the scum of the world and the refuse of all things. Now, was that the verse that led you to Jesus Christ? Were you saved by that verse? Nevertheless, it's in your New Testament. The scum of the world, the refuse of all things, that's us. That's the church. 
We were told that, we, but we're, we're not, we weren't told, hey, you got to play nice inside the walls, but once that thing spills out outside the walls of the church, once it gets out in the world, now all bets are off. You do whatever it takes to win. You get down in the mud if you got to. It's not what it says. It says repay no one evil for evil. It's a broad statement, blanket statement. Lots of things fit under this command. When your neighbor blows all his leaves onto your grass and just leaves them there, you don't get your blower out and blow them all back and leave them there. When you're slandered at work by somebody, you don't take to the rumor mill and then slander them. We just take it as Christians. We know that behaving in a way that anybody on looking would call evil is sinful. We know that. But for whatever reason, when we are sinned against, when we are wronged, we forget that. That just goes out the window. And now we're like, get even. I'm gonna, I, he is going to get what's coming to him. We easily forget that. And I think it's because somehow in the church, we came under the delusion that we were promised that nothing was ever going to happen wrong to you. That you were never going to be wronged by the unbelieving world. That you were never going to be sinned against. I don't know how. Paul's assuming that you're going to get sinned against. Like He says when this happens, not if this happens. And Jesus guaranteed it would happen to his disciples. John 15, 18 through 19, if the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Let it, let's not delude ourselves into thinking that somehow we were promised a life wherein the world would leave us alone to do our own thing. You, the, you guys just do what you want. We're not going to bother you. We'll just let. Why do we think we were promised that? We can't delude ourselves into thinking that the world will inflict evil against us. They will hurt us, guaranteed. That's a promise. And when that happens, we don't respond in kind. And that means not only we as individuals are striving and trying not to do that, but we also have an obligation as church members and covenanted together to stop each other from doing that to address it in each other's lives. You're, you're not free to take that revenge. You're not free to repay evil for evil, brother. You can't do that. We have to move towards each other in those things. What we need to do is to tell them, like Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7, when he says, why not be wronged? Why not be defrauded? That was in the context of Christians taking each other to the court, but the principle still applies. Is what, What's so wrong with being wronged? Why not just be defrauded? So that's what happened to Christ. You know, the church, we take an alternate route, the path of Jesus. Verse 17 continues, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. When it comes to conflict, especially with the unbelieving world, we always take the high road. Always. We're always striving to do what is honorable. Even if they believe it to be foolish or silly or weak, they have to honor it. It is honorable to do that. A person who behaves honorably when they're wrong, they may be mocked for that. They may be thought weak or silly or, or pathetic, but nobody can ever say that they're sinful for that. No one can ever say that, that their sin was unjustified because they responded back to me. They can't say that. They may mock it, but they have to honor it. You might be called weak or pathetic, but you're never going to be called arrogant or antagonistic or retaliatory or divisive, or cutthroat, bloodthirsty. You're not going to be called any of those things because what you're doing is being honorable. The lifestyle of a Christian is honorable. That just comes with it. Philippians 4, 8 says that we are to think on the things that are honorable. We're to apply the things that are honorable. Our lives are to be marked by actions that everyone can honor. What are things that everyone can honor? Being honest, working hard, showing up on time, not cheating, not defrauding, being kind, being selfless, thinking of others, praising others, complimenting other people. That, that is honored by everyone. Being thoughtful. People who exhibit those kind of characteristics, they're respected by everyone. Unbelievers may not want everyone to emulate that. They may be like, well, I don't want to live like that, but hey, kudos for you. They have to honor it. Because there are things that are honorable in everybody's sight that they acknowledge the person is honorable, and the person who lives honorably, the Christian who lives honorably, brings peace with them wherever they go. Proverbs says in Proverbs 3, 3 through 4, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you, meaning don't, don't lose those things. 
Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Keep them close. Why? So that you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. The godly principles and Christ's likeness finds favor in the sight of God and man. And even though we're guaranteed to be hated by the world, we still strive for peace with them. We must. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all. It is anti-Christian to just throw up your hands and go, you don't like us, we don't like you. If you come in here and mess with us, then you're going to get the full fury of who we are. That's inherently anti-Christian. As far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all people. We strive on every level to be peaceful and not antagonistic. Think about, like, it's five years ago or however many years ago. You remember when this, the mayor of Houston, was? she was going to demand sermons? She was going to demand pastor sermons so she could review them to make sure they didn't have hate speech or anti-gay rhetoric and things like that. And, and I had people, when I was preaching elsewhere, they were like, don't you give her that, those sermons. Don't you do that. If it was me, I'd lay my sermon on the table, put an AR-15 on top and say, come and take it. And that is an authentically American response but it is authentically non-Christian as well. You should have been responding, oh, wow, a, a homosexual government official who hates God is going to sit and read my sermon? What, how many do you want? I'll send them all to you. you. You can read them all day and all night. Praise God. I believe more in the power of the gospel than I do in the power of the gavel. So you might get converted, and you're the mayor of the fourth largest city in the country. What a win that would be. I mean, that should be our response, not paying back evil for evil. We're striving to keep peace with everyone. But that does bring us to the qualification clauses in these verses. You see that? Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends upon you, that's how you be at peace. See, peace between the church and the world is only possible insofar as the church pursues it. The world has no reason to seek peace with us. They get no money from us. They were a tax problem. They have no reason. And plus, they're being blinded by the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4 4 says that. Little g God, that means Satan, is blinding them. So why would they seek peace with us? They, They have no reason. So if there will be peace, it will be because we sought peace. We initiated those efforts. We're moving towards them in that way. That that's what our prerogative is to do, our demand is to do, will be labored for, but that peace can only go as far as it depends upon us. There do come times when it no longer depends on us, because in order for there to be peace, both sides have to have consistent attitudes and responses and to agree to something. But there does come a point within the Christian world and the lost world where there is no agreement, right? Right? Because the truths of the scriptures are inherently divisive. And if you don't believe that, let me just quote Jesus Christ to you in Luke 12, 51 through 53. Jesus says, Do you think I have come to give peace on earth? You hear that again? Out of the mouth of Jesus Christ? Do you think I have come to give peace on earth? No, is his answer. I tell you, but rather division from the mouth of Jesus. I did not come to bring peace. I came to divide. To what level, Jesus? Down to the household. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, and mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Why does Jesus divide? Because Jesus' main ministry goal was not peace at all costs. His main ministry goal was truth at all costs. And Jesus is the truth, according to John 14, 6. So therefore, inherently, his presence causes division. It's always going to happen between us and the world. We're striving for peace in every way. But if someone says, you are not going to get nonprofit status anymore unless you affirm these LGBT agenda items and you perform weddings for them, then we say, we're going to lose that nonprofit status then. We can't concede there. We can't agree that that is true. We never have peace at the expense of truth. If an atheist is going to tell me, hey, I will only be your friend. Let's just bring it out to the lowest level. I will only be your friend if you will admit to me that your religion is just a social construct that you and others created so that you can have reasonable understandings for things that seem to be out of your control. If you'll admit that, then I'll be your friend. Then we're going to say, hey, 
I don't know if I can be your friend because I cannot admit that. Because peace only goes so far as we are able to take it. The Bible does not teach peace at all costs because if you have peace at all costs, that means you don't have Bible at all costs. At some point, you watered something down, you folded it on something, you capitulated in some way. Christians cannot and should not be at peace with everyone. But that doesn't mean we're not peaceable. Titus 2.10 instructs us to live in such a way that the doctrine of God our Savior is appealing to other people. That we are kind and reaching out. We're not vindictive. This isn't a freedom to be a jerk because I know there's going to be no peace at some point. No, no, we, we're not rude. But there may not be peace because there's things we can't agree on with a lost and dying world headed by Satan. If the world says, stop proclaiming Christ, or we're going to burn your building down, we keep preaching anyways. Because that's what we were commanded to do. That was our example, not even just of Jesus, but of his disciples in Acts 4, when they're confronted with this in verse 18. So they called them, the disciples, and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Peter says, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and you're going to have to deal with that with God. I can't not preach. I can't not share the gospel. So if the mayor does get my sermon and then does give it back and says, you can't preach that, it has all these things in it, then I have to say, ma'am, respectfully, I'm going to have to decline. I do have to preach that anyways. Come what may. That that there cannot always be peace, and it's easy in those big scenarios to see uh, the the clarity. Right? Oh, of course we're going to keep preaching no matter what the government says. But this trickles down to all lower levels. That there there may not be peace if the other side won't meet you, if they won't talk to you, if they won't be there. Then there was not going to be peace. But because there's an absence of peace, doesn't give you the prerogative to attack. It doesn't go, well, it's not in my hands anymore, so now you're going to get the full barrel. No, it just means there's no peace. It doesn't mean I'm free to move towards you offensively. It just means there's no peace, and I wish there was. That's, that's the, the, the thrust of this verse. We're not allowed to be, to be arrogantly attacking. So what do we do, though, when there is conflict between the church and the world, and it's raised to elevated levels, whether it be an individual, Christian with a lost person, or institutions, what do we do when the level gets raised? Well, we don't seek revenge. That's what we're told. Don't seek revenge. When you are sinned against, and it will happen, you do not seek for revenge. That's what verse 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You see, Paul starts this verse with the word beloved. That's kind of like... Uh, your, your parents saying, sweetheart, right before they spanked you. I love you, but here comes something heavy. I really do, Paul saying, beloved, I do love you, but here is a heavy blow. I'm going to cushion it a little bit by telling you I love you, but this is a hard truth because what he says after that is never avenge yourselves. Never. No matter what level, how high the strife rises between you and the lost, we're commanded to never avenge. You see that never? Yeah, but what if never? Yeah, but what about never? It says never. But what do we do with texts like Exodus 21, 23 through 25? But if there is harm, then you should pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. What about that? Well, if you're going to quote that verse, it means you're just pulling it out of context. That's actually within the context of two men in a fight, and they stumble over into a pregnant woman and hurt her and her unborn baby. Great verse for the sanctity of human life, and that life begins in the womb. Not a great verse for this. But if you kept reading in your Bible, to one book over, and you got to Leviticus, you might find a verse that now we have to wrestle with in 24, 19 through 20. If a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Just as he has injured a man, so shall it be inflicted upon him. This law does pertain to personal, uh, personal retaliation, does pertain to that. So how do we make that square with Romans 12? And then also Matthew 5, where Jesus says, turn the other cheek when somebody wrongs you. Don't go tooth for tooth. What do we do with that? How do we, how do we wrestle with that? This is where, as a side note, Christians, you need to be reading through your whole Bible all the time. 
because you're going to be confronted with things like this and you're going to need to know what to say. What do, uh, I don't, it looks like a contradiction. Or how, do, how do we explain this away? What we're going to have to look at is what's going on in Leviticus 24. That is a civil justice law for a theocratic culture. Civil justice, meaning how do we govern people in a society? Theocratic culture, meaning God is the government. That's not the church. And civil laws are fulfilled in Christ. Civil laws and ceremonial laws of the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ. Moral laws pertain to us. Ten commandments pertain to us. Do not lie is always God's character. But we are now allowed to eat bacon because that's a civil law, ceremonial law of uncleanness that has been fulfilled in Christ. So we need to know our Bibles to understand these things when they come and look like contradiction. Because if you don't know the grand narrative of the Bible, how it arcs throughout the end to the end from Genesis to Revelation, then things like this can become tricky. They can make us stumble. We have to know this. And we will see in Romans 13 when we come back in January on this, that God has delegated the enforcement of justice to a particular entity. And that entity is the government. That they, they do have the sword, but it's a delegated thing from God that evil will be punished. Justice will be meted out and must be meted out by the government, not by us as individuals. So these verses, this verse in Leviticus 24 is not a, not a free pass for me individually to go and seek out my personal vengeance because when you take your own revenge, this is what you're doing, you're telling God you don't trust him. There's no other way around it. When you retaliate against sin towards you, this is what you're telling God. Your justice is flawed or your justice is too slow or straight up, you're just a liar. There is no justice out there. If I will have justice, it will be me going and getting it. That's what you're doing when you're seeking your own revenge. He wrote Deuteronomy 32 and 35. That's the verse that Paul quotes right there in that um, verse 19. That, ju- that vengeance is his to mete out. It's his to dole out to, to those who deserve it. But he also wrote the following verse in Deuteronomy 32, 36. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have his compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone. His people will not vindicate him themselves. He will vindicate them. He does that, not you. See, when you take vengeance into your hands, you necessarily steal it from God's hands. It's only his to give. And when you do it, you're saying, God, you're not doing your job well enough. When you avenge yourself, you cannot but sin. That's your only option. And not only that, but you will do it wrong. You won't do it fully. Only God can take vengeance perfectly. You can't. So the problem, revenge is not bad. Revenge is good. It's bad when you do it. It's good when God does it. And only God can do it correctly. Because when Christians take their own revenge, it's sickening. And it shames the gospel. It's an embarrassment to the cross. When you take it upon yourself to do God's job. Because when we're wrong, we don't want God's justice. We want payback. We want them to hurt. We don't want justice that, that pleases and is, and is coherent with the nature and character of God. We want them to hurt like we hurt. And that's not justice. We aren't looking for justice when we're doing that, when we're taking our own revenge. I'll never forget the clearest picture I saw of this was in high school. We were playing a basketball tournament. We were the only Christian school in this big old tournament full of public schools, like 25, 30 other teams. The only Christian school. We were doing kind of good, so there was lots of people watching us this one particular game, and our point guard got hurt, and he was coming out of the game, and I was on the bench because I had four fouls, just like I always did. Just, just sit there for the rest of the game. And he's coming out of the game, limping, hurt, legitimately hurt. People in the stands are mocking him, and they're just yelling insults at him. I don't really remember anything that they said. I just knew it was bad, and it was vile. It was hurtful. But I do remember what his dad said in response. His dad, who was one of our assistant coaches, also a pastor and a chaplain at the time, he runs over to the end of the bench where his ailing son is now limped to, and these people in the stands are on the other side of the railing yelling insults at him of vile nature. Again, I don't remember them, but I remember exactly what his dad said in response. And I know he would regret it, and I know that he would not say it again, but he did. He looked up in the stands to these 
probably lower income folks, people who weren't from the right side of town or whatever you want to call it, and said, hey, I, be quiet. I don't come into McDonald's and bother you and you're working the fryer. While they were mocking his son in the middle of the stadium, there was no justice in that. That was not vengeance. That was God's vengeance. That was man's vengeance. There was no justice for that. And you know what? It didn't work. All they did was yell more. All they did was mock further. And all that happened was the Christian across our jersey was a laughing stop. It was a joke. Those are just like everybody else when you do that. You can't take your own revenge because you won't do it right. And when you do that, you're displaying your anemic theology. When you take your own revenge. See, we say all the time, we believe in a final judgment. We believe that everybody's going to have to give an account for all the things that they've ever said, and all the things they've ever done that are sinful. That God is a judge and he sees everything. He is sovereign over all. We say we believe that. But when we take our own revenge, you're saying, I don't believe that at all. There is no final judgment. I have to exercise judgment now. There is no consequences. God's not paying attention because if he was, he would have done something. So he's not. Therefore, I need to do something. So your life is contradicting what you say you believe when you take your own revenge. We're stating with our actions we don't really believe that God has wrath or that if he does have wrath, it's not coming. It's not going to get here in time. Or that person's going to get away with it. So we don't believe that God is good and that God follows through and that God is sovereign over his creation. When you take your own revenge, that's what you're doing. These sinners need judgment for their sin. It's not coming now, so I'll just do it. That's what we're saying when we take our own revenge. If you really believe that God had wrath, and you really believe that God's wrath was so terrifying that Jesus, who was God in the Garden of Gethsemane, is praying so hard, he's sweating blood, saying, please don't let this happen to me, God. If you really believe that his wrath is that bad, then why are you trying to enact your piddly little vengeance right now? Why? It, it just means that you don't really believe that God has wrath. He, don't, he doesn't really have judgment. Sin will go unpunished if I don't do anything. One of the most profound stories I've ever heard toward this end was Jonathan Edwards when he gets wrongfully fired from his church. This guy was a, a, an implement in the Great Awakening in the United States in the 1700s. Hundreds of people coming to Christ. A, 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 a historical landmark that everybody has to acknowledge that all these people were coming to Christ. That after a few years go by, one guy gets mad at Jonathan Edwards because he's making everybody take communion only if you're a believer. Only if you're a Christian can you take communion. Shocking revelation there. But then this guy gets mad at him for it, makes a lie up about him, and then the whole congregation believes it, and they fire Jonathan Edwards. And he knew that the guy was lying. And Jonathan Edwards at that point was older in life, according to that era, and he had a big family. So no other church in New England could take him on because they couldn't pay to support his family. His only option was to go out in the wilderness to live with the Indians as a missionary. So he takes his whole family out there. And that guy who lied about him in his church held on to that lie for 10 years. And people who knew Jonathan Edwards, they were like, you know the guy's lying. You need to go and tell everybody. You need to go and vindicate yourself. And he said, I cannot vindicate myself better than God. I can't do it. I believe that God's vindication will surpass anything that I could ever do, and it would be wrong for me to try to get my own vengeance. So he just left. And then, then he goes on to do amazing ministry things. And we're all reading his books now. We're all blessed by his ministry now. And nobody remembers liar guy from his church. He just believed God's word and God came through. He didn't take his own revenge when he could have. Only God can take vengeance without sinning because it's only God who's actually been sinned against. Only God's character is so holy that anything sinful violates and is a direct offense towards him. We sin against each other, but we're also sinners. God's not. So all sin everywhere is an offense directly to him, direct rebellion to him, direct cosmic treason against him. So he can take vengeance perfectly. See, we're just waiters getting yelled at by bratty customers about the quality of the food. It's your, your beef's not with me. It's with the cook. I just brought out what the cook made, and you're yelling at me 
but your problem's not with me, it's with him. And so it's foolish for me as a waiter to get into a tussle with this person because I didn't make the food. I'm just the help delivering it. It's the cook you have a real problem with. The chef is a real problem. So when you as Christians are coming into this place and people are mad at you, they hate you for being a Christian, they really hate God. That's, that's who they hate. That's what they're mad at. And when you have it in your mind, the right perspective, that you know what? I used to be the angry, belligerent customer in the restaurant. But then the chef, then I met the chef. He talked to me. And now I'm new and I'm totally different. Now I can see clearly for the first time in my life. So now I can understand and appropriately interact with this person who is just like me. But I've been shown the light. I've met the chef. Now I'm a waiter. Now I, knows what it, now I know what it's like. I have a divine enlightenment. Your instinct shifts from demanding vindication to dispensing kindness instead. You don't need to be vindicated. You don't need to be proven right. You know who you are and you know who God is. And when you know that, then you don't have to fight for your right to get the wrongs corrected. You can just give kindness. That's what verse 20 says. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's not new with Paul. That's from Proverbs 25, direct quote. So what we see when when we're kind to those who wrong us, two things can happen. One, it's proving that I am obeying and understanding that God's judgment is real. I don't have to deal with this. God's going to deal with this. God's going to right this wrong. The second thing that it does is that it's often used by God to change somebody's heart, to convert their heart. See, in the Old Testament time, burning coals, what we see there in verse 20, it's always associated with judgment. Always associated with judgment. And so we can see there that if I just am kind towards them, then that's just essentially piling up burning coals for them. Their judgment's just getting worse and worse because I'm not retaliating it and taking some of the heat myself. The, the, the judgment, it, I'm, I'm saying, God, I believe you. You say you're good, you say you're sovereign, you say you punish evil, and you say you look out for those who are oppressed. I believe you, so I'll be kind to this person instead. The second thing that it does is that, it, it, that God can use it to convert them because that's otherworldly to behave that way when you're wronged. That, that burning coals on their head that could be referenced to an ancient world practice in Egypt and in the Middle East and Near Eastern cultures, that you would get a pan, put hot coals in it, burning coals on it, put it on your head and walk around for a day or so to show your contrition, that, you, that you're shame, that you were wrong, and that you, you're changing your mind, you're repenting from what you did, you're sorry for it. That in being kind to them, it's like you snap them out of it. Like, oh, yeah, I'm the one being a jerk. I'm the one doing the wrong. So I'll be kind in response, in hopes that God would save them. Because why? They're never the enemy. They're always the objective. They're never the problem. They're always the, the mission. That's who the all unbelievers are. And lastly, we let good triumph. 17 through 20 has been a playbook for letting good triumph. How do we let good triumph in the world? That's what we've seen in these few verses. Because verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you're not living intentionally to apply the gospel that's true of you, to apply what's true in Romans 1 through 11 into the real world in the church and outside the church, if you're not doing that, then evil can overwhelm you. And evil won't overwhelm you in the sense that you get steamrolled like a, like a beetle on a steamroller. Not overwhelmed in that sense, overwhelmed in the sense of overtaken. And it won't be because that sin was so powerful or evil was so powerful that you just got smashed by it. That can't happen. Matthew 16, Jesus promised the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So being overcome by evil means you're just going to drink toxin on your own. Because you're not overcoming evil with good. You're fighting back with that evil and you're drinking poison hoping that they die. You're drinking poison hoping that they get sick. That's how you're going to get overcome with it. That's how you're going to get paralyzed by it. If you're not thinking biblically and thus applying the gospel to how you interact with the contrary world around you, you will be overcome by it. You will be enslaved 
by it. Just like we talked about in Romans 6, you still do know how to be a slave. You're going to be like that elephant, 13,000 pound elephant being driven around by a five foot guy with a four foot bamboo stick. Why are you letting that little guy tell you what to do? Because when you were a baby, that big stick seemed, that short, small stick seemed real big and the guy seemed tall. You're a 13,000 pound elephant. Why are you being driven around by a five foot guy with a little bamboo toy? You can just crush it. So we overcome evil with good. We are not overcome with evil because evil will rule your mind. Think about this. Evil will rule your mind if you abdicate your duty as peacemaker and instead commandeer God's role as avenger. Evil will overwhelm you if you abdicate your role as peacemaker your command to be a peacemaker, and then commandeer and steal God's role as avenger. That's when it will happen. The only way to overcome evil leveled against you is to not let it in. And the way we force it out by, as Christians is by keeping the gospel with us everywhere we go, by striving to make our outer lives match our inner lives. So in conclusion, I want to read you one long quote. It's too good to chop up. It's from Charles Spurgeon, of course. But we're going to read this. I want you to listen to this. It's it's just too good. This passage gives us a choice between two things and bids us choose the better one. We must either be conquered by evil or we must conquer evil. One of the two. We cannot let evil alone and evil will not let us alone. We must fight. And in the battle, we must either conquer or be conquered. Paul's like a wise general who says, conquer or be conquered, be victorious or be defeated. There is no avoiding the conflict, no making truce or holding negotiations, no suspension of hostilities after a brief skirmish. The battle must be fought through to the end and can only close with a decided victory to one or the other side. Soldier of Christ, do you need to debate which of these two to choose victory or defeat. We're not called to conquer evil with evil. That is the way of the world. But to conquer evil with good. This passage demands not merely passive non-resistance, but calls us to active benevolence to enemies. We conquer evil with good with direct and overt acts of kindness. That is, if anyone has done you a wrong, you do not only forgive it, but avenge it by showing him kindness as well. That's how we model Christ's example of overcoming evil with good, because Christ is the ultimate example of that. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. When Jesus was wronged, he didn't even fight back. He didn't even open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silenced before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And Christ will win the lost. Us being proven right and fighting for our rights and doing this and doing that and getting even, that's not going to win anybody to the lost. Christ will win people to the lost. And he will do that by those who are obedient to his gospel that they have embraced by faith. Let's pray.